You're listening to the Unmute Podcast with Maisha Cherry. Welcome to the place where philosophy and real world issues collide. Hello, and welcome to the Unmute Podcast. This is the place where I had the opportunity to talk to young, diverse philosophers about the social and political issues of our day. Today, I chat with Winston C. Thompson. Winston is an assistant professor in the Department of Education and affiliate faculty in the Department of Philosophy at the University of New Hampshire. He received his PhD in Philosophy of Education from Teachers College, Columbia University. His scholarship focuses upon ethical and social political questions of justice, education, and the public good. In this episode, we talk educational justice, potential information, charter schools, free tuition, so much more. Hello, Winston, and welcome to the Unmute Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Winston, tell me, how did you get interested in philosophy? Yeah, so it's interesting. I discovered philosophy while I was perhaps in middle school. I came across some books in a, a library, some books at home. My father had some philosophical books in his library, and so It felt to me at the time as though I'd sort of discovered a secret world, right? Uh, This world where people were asking questions of the sort that I had always asked and and found productive and and rewarding and fulfilling. And it didn't occur to me that it was a world that I could participate in with others until, you know, I was a high schooler thinking about what I would do in college. And it just it just made so much sense to me in that in that moment in my life, in that time to sort of join, in some sense, my people, right? The people who were thinking like me and putting ideas together in ways that made sense to me. And so it seemed, again, it seemed like a very natural transition and perhaps in some ways an inevitable outcome. So right now you presently do work in philosophy of education. How did you make the transition to philosophy simpliciter to get interested in education and philosophy? Yeah, so the work that I did in philosophy as an undergraduate at the time, it wasn't clear to me that all of the, the sort of the projects that I was working on were projects that were ethical in, in sort of their, their underlying um, impulses, but also uh, social and political. Uh, and it, at the time, I began asking some questions about utopia and sort of how we might create a better world, right? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a very sort of rough take on my sort of embarrassing undergraduate uh, work in philosophy. But I began in, in asking some of those questions, I started branching out, taking courses in other colleges at the university and other schools at the university outside of liberal arts and outside of philosophy. And so I found my way into sociology. I found my way into religion, the study of religion. And I found my way into some very preliminary work in education. And it became clear to me that education was one of these sort of hot spots. It was a place that a lot of the questions that I was interested in came to a head and kind of theory met practice. And it was the case that education was this domain in which a lot of the questions that I was pursuing could really have some, some uptake. People thinking about the future, thinking about making that future better, thinking about making themselves better, thinking about their obligations to the wider society. A lot of those questions get articulated and pursued rather nicely in the study of education. And so it was the case that I began studying, particularly studying access to higher education. I think it's not coincidental that I went to a a high school with many people who didn't end up making it to the university, right? And many of the people that I knew at the university didn't make it out of the university with a degree. And so I think I had some rather personal questions about access to higher education. And of course, given my philosophical orientations, I began pursuing some of those questions through through, through the traditions of philosophy in my early graduate work. So you're currently doing work on educational justice. So tell me, you make a distinction between what we call topics of educational justice and the concept of educational justice. Can you tell us what is the difference between the two? Yeah, so to my my reading of a lot of the literature on educational justice, so a lot of the, the educational research and educational scholarship often invokes the idea of justice in trying to make sense of some topics that the researcher, the scholar, uh, thinks that uh, sort of deserve our attention. So uh, what I mean by uh, sort of the, the, the different ways or the different types of, of, of discussions of educational justice, to my mind, they're both in the mainstream 
work on educational justice, they're both rather political. So the first type of, of educational justice is going to be that sort of, it's the invocation of the concept of educational justice as though uh, educational systems are either just or unjust when they're sort of pursuing their educational goals uh, because they either honor or fail to honor a traditionally political standard of justice. And so the work that I, that I do on sort of understanding, if you will, this first type of educational justice is towards understanding the ways in which this type of educational justice engages that topic of educational justice without doing very much work on the concept itself. To my mind, the second type of educational justice is related in that it's also political in nature, but rather than sort of uh, thinking of educational goals as honoring some traditionally political standard of justice, it's the case that under the second type, we might think of the educational goal as being almost identical or synonymous with political standards of justice. And so to my mind, both of these types of educational justice get invoked often as educational scholars are talking about topics of educational justice. So there's not really much attention given to the fact that there are these two different types of educational justice described, nor is there much attention given to perhaps what this typology overlooks or, or uh, the ways in which it limits the, the scope of the discussion that we might have about the very concept of educational justice itself. You, you evoke and give uptake to terms such as, as potential and formation in your work. So how might we understand educational justice on your view and the ways that take potential and formation seriously? And that is also more expansive than the two traditional types of educational justice that you just referred to. Yeah. So to my mind, you know, if we're thinking of discussions of educational justice as being primarily political in nature, I think that the two types that I've just given a sense that I've just given you a sense of do a lot of really good work. But I think if we sort of press the concept of educational justice and ask ourselves what sort of things might be owed to one as an educational matter, right, rather than as a political matter in the context of education, I think then we begin asking ourselves or we might begin asking questions of one's potential and how one comes to be formed relative to that potential. So again, if we think about justice as making sure that uh, uh, one gets what one is owed, educational justice, on my view, might begin asking questions about what one is owed in light of one's potentials, right? One's potentials to become or to be formed in one way or another, right? It's often, it's the case that we might recognize that there are going to be some limitations, some trade-offs that have to be made under conditions of affinitude, right? I mean, we've got only a finite amount of time, energy, et cetera. In this work, I've been drawing on some of the work of Robbie McClintock, and McClintock gives a really, to my mind, really nice articulation of the degree to which questions of human potential are at the very core of what we might mean when we're discussing educational justice, again, from this educational perspective rather than only the political perspective. And on my view, it's the case that these two perspectives certainly overlap in practice and conceptually sort of lean on one another in ways that will call us to ask, of course, questions of distribution, distributive justice, and to answer those questions as those questions feed into this sort of more educationally focused approach that I'm, that I'm, that I'm outlining here. So, so give us an example, Winston. I know you, you give an example in your work, but give us an example how this looks on the ground. Yeah. So it might be the case that we find ourselves in a situation in which, you know, we check all the boxes relative to political justice, whatever the sort of uh, um, approach to political justice is that we've got, we can sort of really check all the boxes according to a particular theory or theories of political justice. And we're sure that in an educational environment, you know, we're not distributing uh, resources, goods in such a way that we're, you know, overlooking the rights or maligning the uh, intentions of, of, of persons, right? We're recognizing people as they are in the moment and so forth. But what my work would pose is the observation that uh, even if we're meeting all those standards, uh, it might be the case that there are still some sense of an injustice, an educational injustice under certain conditions, right? And that educational injustice might, again, not be linked only to those political uh, standards that we hope to, hope to endorse, but instead is linked to the observation that one or another, particularly valuable, likely, potential is being overlooked or uh, under attended to such that a third party might observe that a situation is a real shame or a real injustice or it falls short in some ways because it fails to, to give to the individual what they are owed relative to their potentials. 
let's go into the classroom now. Let's go into a, a typical high school in the United States. Let's make it more specific. Let's go to an East Coast high school, let's say an inner city of sorts, right? Uh, where a large uh, population of Black and Latino folks, right? And if you were to go into, let's say that you become the the educational injustice inspector, right? What would you see in classrooms that would indicate to you that based on your view, that an educational injustice is taking place? Yeah, so that's a great question, Maisha. So one of the things that we might observe, and, and in some ways this is going to kind of point to some of the work that, uh, some of the good work that Miranda Fricker has done on epistemic injustice, right? So as Fricker has sort of talked about the ways in which, and she gives some some very nice articulations and, and explications of the different ways that we might think about that epistemic injustice. If we think about the ways in which a person is sort of not given their due relative to their status as a knower, I'd like to extend that towards thinking about the way in which a person might not be given their due in their status as one who is coming to know themselves or the world around them. So in the example that you or in the, the context that you're that you're presenting here, uh, we might imagine all sorts of ways, right, in which the individual, let's imagine black Latino student, comes to recognize themselves and recognize the world in a way that sort of diminishes their sense of what is possible in that world and what they're capable of doing relative to sort of facts of the matter, right? So if it's the case that the educational experience is somehow suggesting to these students that option, that there's either sort of possibility A or, or, or option A is necessarily more realistic than possibility B, um, I think it's the case that we might be uh, witnessing an educational injustice if it's the case that that educational experience is one that diminishes an individual's capacity to realize their elements of their potential that they would have some cause to value. And in some sense, you know, my account here draws also from Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach. Again, that, that's sort of the language that I'm using there about, about one's sort of potential. You might sort of think of that in regards to one's capabilities, right? So that those sorts of things that individuals are able to do or to be. But I, I see myself as kind of pushing that capabilities approach to some degree and ensconcing the, this account of educational justice within, perhaps, potentially, a capabilities approach to these issues, or potentially, I could imagine this account of educational justice living within another approach entirely. So the, so the account would, would suggest that in these education environments that I'm referring to, yeah. um, that they ought to create spaces in which young people or, or uh, knowers can flourish in ways that will actualize their potential. That's right. That's right. And that we've got some and that the, the question of sort of discovering or deliberating about which potentials we're going to pursue, right, is in some sense a question of justice. It's a question of educational justice. It's a question of educational justice for the school, for the educator working with the student, but also the student herself, right, to begin thinking about uh, what, what, which of her potentials she wishes to elevate, especially given, as I mentioned before, conditions of finitude in which there have to be some choices made about which parts of oneself one will actually pursue developing. So I'm going to insert you into a debate and I just want to I want to get your brief opinion about this. So as you're talking and talking about potential information, I'm thinking about Booker T and W. Du Bois. And I know you probably got asked this question before. <laughs> of course. So if, if you could take a position and just give us why, which one of them you think were right in, in regards to educational justice on your view? Which one was closer? Yeah. So I think that there, the, the difficult thing here is that, I'm, is that you've asked me to be brief. So let me, <laughs> let me, let me, try, let, let, let me try to let me try to do that by saying, by saying the following. <laughs> I think that given the conditions of the time, that there were cases to be made on both sides of that debate, right? I think that given the conditions of this moment, so we're, you know, we're talking now, you know, in 2017, the end of 2017, I think under these conditions, it's certainly the case that educational justice ought to, yes, have an, have an eye towards, you know, what sorts of uh, what sorts of outcomes are likely to be possible for persons under the social conditions under which they live. But I think it's it's the case that the social conditions under which we all live are expansive enough that uh, some of the high-minded pursuits that are you know characteristic of my own experiences uh, could certainly be pursued. <laughs> Good answer. Good neutral answer. So try, try, trying to be brief as well. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 
You say you say in your work, and I'm going to quote you here, you quote, politics, especially in a democratic context, can be understood as an essentially educational project, end quote. What do you mean by this? Yeah. So in some of my work, what I've been what I've been attempting to do is to show that the relationship between politics and education, as I alluded to earlier, the relationship between politics and education is often presumed to sort of operate in, in, in one direction in which educational concerns are sort of subsumed under larger political concerns. Under my view, it's the case that we might also think of that relationship as operating in an inverted fashion in which political concerns can be understood as really sort of falling under the umbrella of education. And so that line that you, that you referenced there is, in what is, is a statement about that. And what I mean by this is that there's a way of thinking about politics, sort of, especially in a democracy, as sort of the interchange of ideas, the sort of expression of positions, values that uh, individuals hold as being an activity that is educational in the sense that it is an activity in which uh, individuals are making the case to one another, attempting to teach one another about the experiences of those who are unlike oneself, right? It's the case that one way of thinking about politics is as an act of continual self-study, right? That a community, a polity, a a society is engaged in an act of self-study about its problems, about the solutions to those problems, and the ways to pursue those solutions. You know, John Dewey, you know, in democracy and education, gives an account of democracy as being essentially educational. And though he's not talking about democracy only as a system of government, right? He's not only talking about politics, he's talking about sort of democracy as a way of life. I do think that there's a foundation there, there's a core that we can pursue that allows us to recognize that the actions and the the, the systems of politics are in some sense about communication and about recognition of shared problems and shared attention towards inquiry into figuring out how to address those problems. So I know a former question of mine took us back uh, to the 20th century. So I I really want to bring us into 2017 with this question. And yet I still think it's a controversial educational question. So given your view of educational justice, how might you respond to the following educational issues? So the first one is charter schools. Sure. So uh, let me say that charter schools. So, okay. so given given the account that I've given you now, about educational justice, I'm going to want to focus primarily on, on, in the first instance, primarily on the person and sort of what the person can achieve and accomplish relative to their potentials. On the second order, I think I might want to talk about uh, what a society, what a polity, what a group of people can achieve and accomplish. So given that, it's, po- it's entirely possible that charter schools can pursue educational justice uh, by tailoring the types of educational experiences that individuals have, especially in communities in which you know, certain individuals and, and members of particular identity groups have been historically and presently underserved. Charter schools represent a change, and with that change, they represent some possibilities. And so I certainly think that it's the case that on the individual level, a, a certain type of educational justice could be pursued with greater freedom under charter conditions. Now, given the ways that charter schools actually tend to operate in the world around us in 2017, as you mentioned, I think that there is a larger question about what a society can pursue as a matter of educational justice via charter schools. And I think the charter schools ultimately sort of erode some of our abilities to to engage in some of the the shared processes of life lived amongst others, right? So, I mean, without getting into all of the details about how charter schools operate and how they select or retain certain types of students and the ways in which they visit upon certain communities, certain burdens, I would say that uh, uh, I think it's more difficult to make the case for charter schools when we're looking at things from a systemic level than when we're looking at things from the individual level, which in part might be why many parents and individuals might be in favor of charter schools for their students, for their children, uh, for the people around them, whereas by and large, most educational scholars are either antagonistic towards charter schools or agnostic and somewhat ambivalent about the relative or or the reported successes of charter schools at that systemic level. All right. Second issue, free tuition, and particularly referring to higher education. Yeah. So, so, that that issue is is one that I think becomes tricky as we start thinking about the history of higher education in this country and what higher education historically has represented and represents in the present moment. Given the degree to which higher education is almost a requirement for access to a livable wage in, in the society, and it seems as though things are getting worse, although perhaps you know I might be speaking from my own 
particular positions as someone who went to the university and took out student loans and uh, is still living with those loans. Tell me about it. Uh, and I'm sure that your, your listeners uh, know this, you know, know this experience well. I think that free tuition is certainly a way, or, or, or at least let me just, let me pull back slightly and say subsidized tuition is a way to, to better realize educational justice as it makes access to the experiences of the educational institution available for a larger selection of persons. Now, whether or not that, that free tuition or subsidized tuition would result in, you know, a further bifurcation of sort of, you know, your upper echelon or more desirable educational experiences relative to less desirable educational experiences, I'm somewhat, I've got no, no strong view of what would likely happen. But I do think that uh, free tuition would certainly increase access while potentially also uh, visiting burdens upon, upon persons who receive that, that tuition as they're likely, given the history of higher education in this country, likely going to be recipients of a, a subpar educational experience relative right. to those who likely would be able to, to pay for it. Yep. All right. Last controversial issue, decolonize the curriculum. Yeah. So this is a great issue to, to, to think about under the lens that I'm suggesting, right? So if you'll recall the comments that I made about the, the school setting that you, that you invoked earlier, we might imagine that decolonizing the curriculum is one way and sort of calls to decolonize the curriculum. And, and, I, I'm, and I'm sorry, once I know we're using the term, maybe we should explain it briefly and then if you can continue. So calls to decolonize the curriculum are certainly are calls to recognize the degree to which the curriculum, the subject matter taught, uh, draws upon particular traditions, cultures, and prioritizes those cultures and traditions over the cultures and traditions of those individuals who are the recipients of the, of the subject matter, right? So a very sort of easy way of kind of, of thinking about it is that people aren't taught about themselves in, their, uh, in the subject matter that is, that's presented to them. And so, so yeah, so, so as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the view that I have is certainly one that would be in favor of uh, reviewing and revisiting the curriculum in attempts to, to understand the ways in which the curriculum might be reifying certain social structures, but also certain uh, conceptual or intellectual interpersonal relationships to what it means to know, what it means to be uh, an educated person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Winston, you are a new father of baby Elliot. Is he is he a year now? I mean, how, how old? So yeah, so he's he's older than a year now. He is sixteen months, if you can 16 believe it. Sixteen months. Okay, you're still counting months, so he's still very. That's young. right. That's right. Okay. That's right. So I want to know how has fatherhood changed you as an educator? Yeah, that's a it's a it's a fantastic question because I think it certainly has changed me as an educator. I mean, so so many of the educational so so I don't have a background in early childhood education. The educational work that I've done in classrooms has always been with older children, high school, middle school, with a couple of rare exceptions, then, of course, working at the university. But thinking about the, the gulf, if you will, between my intentions and my son's ability to sort of understand those intentions has really created in me a greater sense of, of patience with, with students, I think, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> But it's also given me a sense of the degree to which, you know, some of the, the educational, if you will, uh, the, the ethical dilemmas of education that I, that I, you know, find myself thinking about working on and, uh, and considering, you know, it, it just kind of, it, it pulls them directly to the ground, right? It grounds them in the lived experience as, you know, for instance, some work that I've been doing about sort of the ethical issues involved in bringing a person into a racial identity, right? On the one hand, you know, we might uh, recognize an obligation to bring people into a, a very clear understanding of their racial identities. And on the other hand, some people claim that bringing people into that understanding does them a sort of cognitive disadvantage. Well, those issues are no longer only academic issues for me, right? You sometimes hear parents at the playground and at the preschool talking about how nice it is that their children don't see race. Well, I don't know. Is, is, that, is that nice? <laughs> it becomes for me a very active and embodied question worthy of philosophical exploration, particularly as an issue of, of education. So Winston, you also have a podcast and I want you to tell my listeners a little bit about the podcast. Why did you start it and where can folks find it? 
Yeah, so the podcast is entitled Pipeline, Profiles in Philosophy and Education. And people can find the the podcast and, and the episodes at www.pipeline.fm. And it's also available in Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get you get podcasts. So the, 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 the project began for me uh, sort of in recognition of the fact that many of my students were trying to figure out what, what, what's sort of going on in the world of philosophy of education, right? Uh, philosophy is well understood, education is well understood, but the intersection of the two perhaps uh, is less well understood by, by folks who are not initiated into, if you will, into the tradition. And so I really wanted to provide a space for people to, you know, get a sense of some of the folks who are working in philosophy of education at the moment, some of the, uh, some of the work that they've been doing, some of the questions that they've been asking, and to provide a sense of some of their, um, uh, those scholars, a sense of the questions that should be asked uh, in the field, such that uh, young scholars might uh, pick up some of those questions and bring, and, and uh, through picking up those questions, enter the field of philosophy of education. And so the, the, the series has been exactly that. It's me interviewing folks and uh, getting a sense of uh, their entry into philosophy of education, uh, their work, and their sense of what awaits folks in the future of the field. So speaking of podcasts, and this with our last question, how sure. optimistic are you about this, this podcast medium in the long run? And what impact, if any, do you think this will have on the public and also the profession of philosophy? So I think that uh, podcasts in general are a great way to to access new ideas, right? I mean, so there used to be, without you know, getting into that history, of course, but there used to be this this great history of people listening to the radio and public radio and talk radio, et cetera, that just you know, in recent years has has certainly been on the decline. And I think podcasts are a great way to have you know busy people engage with ideas when they're on the go, traveling on the train, uh, driving to work, uh, it's uh, you know, cleaning around the house, et cetera. And I think that philosophy is well served. By engaging in the in the in the in the uh, domain of of podcasts, because uh, many people, when they think of philosophy, think that it's something that is inaccessible, that it happens in the ivory in the ivory tower and only there. And I think that podcasts are a great way for people to sort of ease into a recognition that philosophy happens on the street, it happens in your home, it happens in your conversations with friends. It's the case that most folks are have have engaged in some philosophical discussion perhaps you know not uh, the most rigorous philosophical discussion but engaged in philosophical discussion uh, at some point in their lives and i think that uh, podcasts of this sort and of the sort that that i've got with my program do a great job of uh, demystifying the field of philosophy i think it's also the case and with my program i'm i'm attempting now to sort of transition into what i'm calling volume 2 of my program it's also the case that philosophy can sort of speak to concerns that people have about the world around them. And podcasts are a great way to sort of access uh, those persons who might be engaging with those concerns. And by this, I mean to uh, sort of allude to the ways in which, you know, some of the work that I've been doing in philosophy of education through the podcast has been an attempt to try to engage some public issues or, or issues of public policy or public concern. You asked me some very great questions about, for instance, charter schools or free tuition or decolonizing the curriculum. How wonderful would it be to my mind, the answer is very wonderful. How wonderful will it would it be <laughs> to, to have you know episodes of 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 my podcast about philosophy of education that deal with you know one of these issues at a time? So taking on charter schools and having multiple philosophers weigh in on the pros, the cons, the intricacies, the nuance, the uh, dilemmas that it that it presents. So people might listen to the podcast and through listening to the podcast be better equipped to enter into public discussions at town hall meetings, uh, enter voting booths, engage with uh, fellow citizens around these issues, charter schools, decolonizing the curriculum, uh, et cetera. I see a lot of, a lot of really great opportunity for the, the good work that philosophers do and publish in academic journals to be brought to the people through podcasts as an easier avenue for laypersons to sort of pick up and engage with the, the, the very careful and rigorous thinking done by philosophers on public policy issues. And I will add, by reiterating you, I think it'll be another way to administer educational justice. Don't you agree? <laughs> I do agree. I do agree indeed. That's a, that's a great point. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Winston, for coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much, Maisha. It was a pleasure. 
For more access to the Unmute Podcast, subscribe on iTunes or head over to the website at www.unmutepodcast.co. There you can get more information about our guests, participate in giveaways, as well as learn more about people, books, and concepts mentioned in today's episode. Until next time, remember that your silence will not protect you. Listen, think, speak. The world will be different as a result.